Good day, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Spotlight by Artigas Land in partnership with the Philippine Daily Inquirer's Property Section. I am Texa Maniego, and I will be your host for today. Spotlight by Artigas Land is a series of light and insightful conversations with Filipino leaders, influencers, and movers from across the globe. And for this episode, we will talk more about U.S. immigration policies governing Filipino Americans, immigrants, and overseas Filipinos. In particular, we will look at the current state of Filipino immigrants in the United States and how the pandemic has affected their petitions for their relatives, their status as temporary or permanent residents, and their entry to the U.S. Also, we will look into the processes involved should they choose to go home and settle into the Philippines, including options for Pinoy immigrants who are thinking of retiring or returning to their homeland. This is a highly relevant issue today. Although immigration admittedly has presented some of the most valuable opportunities for many Filipinos, crises like the COVID-19 pandemic are also presenting a number of challenges for many of them living abroad. Thus, it is all the more crucial for them to know and understand the various laws relevant to them. To talk more about these pressing matters with us today is a San Francisco-based immigration lawyer, co-founder and partner at Tancinco Law Firm, serving thousands of Filipino families and businesses for over 28 years. She is a Filipino World War II veterans advocate and a multi-awarded TV host, producer, and columnist in the area of U.S. immigration law. She is an active community leader and is currently the vice chair of the Friends of UP Foundation in America and immediate past president and founder of the Bayanihan Equity Center in San Francisco, California. Ladies and gentlemen, I am privileged to introduce to you Attorney Lourdes Tancinco. Welcome, Attorney Lou. Thank you, Tech. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Now, um, I'm really thankful to Ortigas Land and to Philippine Daily Inquirer for this opportunity. And uh, without uh, further ado, I'd like to, I'm excited to share some good and not so good uh, information about uh, US policies right now. Uh, let me share you some more. Hold on, uh, some technical difficulty. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to share you my screen. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, uh, so today, uh, please bear with me. Uh, I'm going to be very, uh, very thorough, but at the same time, I'll try to my best to explain what is really going on right now uh, during the pan pandemic uh, since March. Actually, uh, since March, there's been more than 48 uh, new immigration policies, and I will only tackle on those that are more relevant. Uh, immigration is not just about uh, the visa or the petition. It is also about our family and our future. So I would say United States is still among the many other countries uh, where Filipinos uh, would go. Uh, it's a favorite destination either to visit, study, or work, or live permanently. I've come up with uh, some statistics here uh, so that you have an idea how many we are right now. So these are based on the census. Uh, so for 2000, uh, 2.6, uh, and then we increase 44% uh, after one decade. That's three, five million. There's an ongoing census right now, uh, but uh, in between uh, 2010 and 2020, there is a slow growth. Uh, in 2018, uh, according to the American Community Survey, there's just like 4.4. Uh, million Filipinos, but still to me, that's a lot. Now, uh, in fiscal year 2018, we have this figure uh, from, from the USCIS or from the Department of Homeland Security. 
LPRs represent the green card holders, okay? So if you would see here, 49% uh, of those coming uh, from the Philippines are actually uh, immediate relatives of US citizens. 32% uh, are family sponsored preferences. And then we have only 18% who are employment based. So I would say that majority of those who are green card holders right now are actually petitioned by their relatives. So with this figure, we can conclude that uh, there are still like 44,000, uh, I would say 44,000 Filipinos every year coming here on a green card uh, visa or on an immigrant visa. Now what happened during the pandemic? In March 2020, when global pandemic was declared, we experienced closures of most government offices, including the US Citizenship and Immigration Services. So you can see here on the slide, the US Department of Homeland Security and the US Department of State are the agencies uh, responsible for issuing the visas. So first they file petition with the USCIS and then it stays at the US Department of State for a while if it's a preference category uh, before they get interviewed at the US Embassy. Now, uh, during the pandemic, they say they were closed but they're actually just closed uh, for uh, physical. They're just closed for uh, in-person interviews. In fact, they, we are actually uh, receiving- uh, Just a moment. Hold on. We are actually receiving uh, some uh, documents, uh, petitions uh, if from- If you like, I can search the web for. This is what I'm saying about technology. <laughs> okay. So there are, you are still receiving some receipt notices approvals. The only problem is that they stop issuing visas at the US embassy. Now, uh, at the U.S. Embassy, uh, we can say that uh, they were closed in March, but beginning July, they're beginning to actually uh, set interview for visa applicants. As of now, uh, they're open to interview non-immigrant visas, uh, but only limited to student visas, the F and M, the J certain categories, the, the alien physician government visitors, the C1, D, uh, the crewman and the transit visa. They are also issuing visas and interviewing for investors visas, I, foreign media representatives, and they are also interviewing for ONP, we are the extraordinary ability artists uh, or athletes. What about for immigrant visas uh, or the green card? They are now limiting only interviews uh, by petitions, petitions by US citizens on behalf of spouses and minor children. Petitions by U.S. citizens on behalf of spouses who were just married for less than two years. Those are the CR1 visas. And uh, you would notice also that they started uh, interviewing for the employment-based third preferences, the EB3 nurses. You will uh, find this at the U.S. Embassy website. Now, um, to begin with, uh, it is important to understand that sometime in April, uh, Trump actually came out with the presidential proclamations. There are two of them, this uh, April and uh, in June. What these presidential proclamations means is that they suspend entry of immigrants who present risk to the US labor market during the economic recovery following COVID-19 outbreak. What that means is that supposedly these proclamations will protect uh, the citizens uh, from, you know, from, from COVID or from being infected, but it's saying here uh, they are actually protecting the U.S. labor market. So what are these uh, Trump proclamations? Uh, let's start with the April 23, uh, 2020. It actually barred uh, visas being issued to parents of U.S. citizens it also bars entry of those uh, with the visa, uh, with those who are applying for visas and are adult children of US citizens, spouses and minor children of green card holders. So if you would, if you would notice, they only limited uh, the issuance of visas to spouses and minor children. Supposedly parents are considered immediate relatives. For some reason, they are not considered immediate relative and are barred from entering. So if you have a visa petition for your parent and the visa is available and your parent was already interviewed, no visa is going to be issued. Same thing with adult children of US citizens, spouses and minor children of green card holders. Now for the second one, second proclamation, 
This time they included in the bar H1B visas, H2 B visas, and the L1 visas. Uh, the bar uh, of April has been extended until December 31, 2020. Now with these uh, employment visas, there was a lot of resistance from US employers resulting in a lawsuit that was filed. So very recently, uh, this proclamation or ban was not uh, actually applicable to certain plaintiffs of that lawsuit, but still generally H1B, H2B, J, certain J visas and L1 visas are not being issued right now. Now, the proclamations uh, is not applicable to those who are already in the US, okay? Of course, this is about suspension of entry. It does not also apply uh, to those who are outside the US and are green card holders. It does not apply to those who have uh, travel documents uh, like the re-entry permits and advanced parole. It does not apply to healthcare workers, uh, medical workers who will try to help out with, with the alleviating the effects of COVID-19, such as the H-1B and J-1 visa physicians. It does not also apply to B-1, B-2 students, investors, artists, foreign media. As, as, as I mentioned also, it does not apply to spouses, minor children of US citizen, meaning to say below 21 years old. Now, if they are a subject to the ban, they can also apply for exemption. The exemption are those, uh, if there is a national security involved, if there is a COVID medical care involved with the provision of medical care to those who have contracted COVID-19, those who are involved in medical research at US facilities to help the US combat COVID-19. What is important here to note is that aging out children may ask for exemption. So if you have children who are turning uh, 21 and uh, they need to be interviewed and issued the visa, you have to ask for an exemption from the US embassy. Now let's go to the temporary visas. For the temporary visas, uh, let's start with the visitor or business. There are those with visitor's visa who are in the US right now. And when uh, there was a, you know, when pandemic was declared here in March, they're still here. And some of them have overstayed already. Uh, we are hoping that they have filed uh, for their application for extension so that they are not out of status because there is no exemption to that one. Although they can try to explain why they have fallen out of status, it is important to know what steps they, are, they have to take uh, if they are still here and their visa had already expired. Now, what about the student visas? This one is also subject to litigation. There was a time in July where the Department of Homeland Security said that for student visas, if their uh, classes are 100% online, they should not be here or they should fall out of status. Again, there is a litigation. Uh, and so therefore Department of Homeland changed it. The, the rule right now is if you are a continuing, if you are a continuing student, you already had the F1 or M1 visa as of March. 2020, and you are outside the US, for example, you are in the Philippines, you can still re-enter the US. And even if you are engaged in 100% uh, online or distance learning. Now, what is also important to note are initial students. If uh, there are those who were issued uh, foreign, uh, uh, foreign uh, international student visas or the F1 visas, they will not be allowed to enter if their classes are 100% online. These are the ones who have not entered the US yet. Now, there are also other uh, visas, as I mentioned, if you have seen the other slide uh, that says that they are not allowed in the H1, H2B, L1, and J1. Now, they can always ask for an exemption or if uh, their sponsors or US employers belong to the group of uh, plaintiffs that filed the case, then they can still enter the United States. Now, the most important uh, thing uh, to discuss right now is what about uh, the green cards? There are many Filipinos who actually uh, become uh, become green card holder for different reasons. Uh, of course, they, they are petitioned by their children or for work, it's better to do that, uh, to work here and save and then go back to the Philippines. But uh, there are some who really, really want to stay in, in the Philippines. And with that, should they actually abandon their status or 
should they maintain their status as a green card? Let's take uh, two cases here. Case one, you have a green card holder who is still in the Philippines and after six months, but less than one year, uh, he's still there and he's returning before the one year. What will happen? Now, if you are returning after more than six months, there will be the usual strict scrutiny by the CBP officer when you enter the US because you are considered to be seeking admission. Meaning to say, your green card is not just sufficient for entry. They will have to look whether or not there are reasons to deny your entry. But if you mention COVID-19 circumstances had prevented you from returning, more likely than not, you will have no problem entering the US. CBP has not fixed policy on this, has no fixed policy. And they said they will take the matter on a case by case basis. Now for the second scenario, a green card holder has been outside the United States uh, for more than 12 months. Now this is again a case by case basis. What does 12, more than 12 months mean? Could be two years, three years, or four years, okay? You, uh, your green card is considered abandoned after one year. So let's just assume that because of uh, COVID, you are not able to return to the US uh, after one year. If you're a green card holder, you should not stay outside the US for more than a year. So what happens if you stay for more than a year, you will be deemed to have abandoned your residence. You need to obtain what you call the SB1 or returning resident visa from the US embassy and explain that your reason for untimely return is COVID-19 related reason. More likely than not, you will be granted a returning resident visa as long as, long as there is proof that you have not abandoned your resident status in the US. Now, if you say you are in a rush to return and you flew in the US without the returning resident visa, you will be asked uh, at the port of entry and uh, you will be asked by the CBP to explain your absence for a year. They may or may not allow you in. But if I would say, if you say it's a COVID related reason, more likely than not, they are flexible. They are saying that they're going to take it on a case by case basis. Now, uh, let's go now to the recent developments. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, because of the proclamations, not many of the family-based petition visas are being issued right now. And so therefore resulting in unused visas on the family base. Uh, since there are, there are unused visas in the family base, they went on uh, to go through the employment-based petitions. So if you will look at the visa bulletin for October 2020, that is this month, and this is the Philippines, the, Philippines, you will see C, C represents for current, C in the second, third, others, and fourth. What this means is that there are employment-based visas that are now available. So if there are petitions that are approved under these employment-based visas, including the nurses, physical therapists, and even caregivers, they are now eligible to adjust their status and or they can also apply for the visa at the U.S. Embassy. Again, but only if there is already an approved petition. Now, uh, for the last uh, issue that I'd like to tackle, uh, for those applying uh, for immigrant visa, there is what you call a public charge rule. What is a public charge? Applications for immigrant and non-immigrants may be denied based on findings that the visa applicant is more likely than not to be a public charge. Okay, uh, meaning to say that they will be depending on uh, public, uh, for public benefits and be relying on them for their sustenance. And what will happen is that if that is the case, the visa is going to be denied. In the past, uh, in the old rule, an affidavit of support should be sufficient Sometimes if the petitioner does not have enough income, you will ask a relative uh, if uh, they can co-sponsor that uh, then the, this relative will also execute an affidavit of support in addition to the affidavit of support of the petitioner. But now the rule is this, the rule is now not, the affidavit of support and even that of your co-sponsor is not sufficient anymore. USCIS is now looking at the totality of circumstances. If the applicant for a visa is showing that more likely than not, uh, he, he or she is going to rely on the public benefits, the immigrant or non-immigrant visa will be denied. So right now they're looking at employability, they're looking at age, health, and prior receipts of public benefits. 
So again, this is not a good. Uh, this is not a good rule. They call it a wealth test. Uh, wealth test meaning to say that uh, they have uh, the the policy only favors those who are rich. And what about those who are who are already uh, seniors, for example? What about those who have uh, illness, for example? Then there will be problem uh, as far as their immigrant visa application is concerned. Now, uh, I also prepared a chart here of uh, what constitute and not constitute public charge. So this one here, uh, if you're receiving cash, uh, cash benefit, you'll be considered a public charge. And uh, for, for other benefits, they, they are not considered public charge such as the medical uh, for children. Med uh, up to age 26, medical for pregnant women and people with emergency medical conditions. These are mostly in the state of California. Now with that discussion on this last topic, I conclude my presentation. I just want uh, to put a stamp date. Today is October 16, 2020, and my discussion is current and valid as we are talking right now. Because uh, immigration law is very dynamic field, uh, the policies are very fluid and they may change very fast. And of course, not to mention, we are in the middle of an election and we hope to be able to revisit our discussion. In the meantime, let's open the webinar to our Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney Lou. That was indeed a very informative discussion. By now, I know many of you have already question, questions in mind. So feel free to send them via FB or via the Q&A button here in Zoom or via the comment section on our Ortigas Facebook page and we'll try to answer as many as we can. But before we get to those questions, let's just first watch this video to see the future of Ortigas East.
welcome back everyone and we will now proceed to the Q&A portion. Let me start with our first question from our audience. Attorney Lu, are many Filipinos still trying to get to the U.S. or has the number changed over the years? Well, uh, as I, I mentioned to you, I think in the last decade, uh, the number of uh, Filipinos uh, coming here is not as many as it was between 2000 and 2010. And I can attribute that to, to the fact that they have actually uh, restricted uh, the rules in uh, applying for visas and there's just uh, too much a uh, hurdle or bars uh, that they have to overcome. But it doesn't mean that the, they cannot petition. They can still uh, continue with their visa petition, except that they, sometimes the line is really long. So would you say, attorney, that it is really more difficult now? I mean, what are the common reasons why individuals would fail to get an immigrant status? Yeah, there, there are several reasons, Tech. No? Uh, number one is that uh, if, there is, if there is a prior criminal case in the past or if there's a prior uh, denial, and even if there's no fraud or misrepresentation, it requires more uh, investigation. And then also we have uh, some, there has been recently uh, denials because of the public charge issue where they cannot say, uh, state, you know, they cannot show sufficient income, which is, which is really sad uh, because it, would, it always results in uh, uh, family separation or more lengthy delay in the approval of the petitions. Uh, attorney, would you say that the current situation now also prevented most uh, Filipino immigrants from petitioning because of this COVID-19, from petitioning their relatives, their children, or their spouses? Yeah, as, uh, as I mentioned in the first part of my uh, presentation, that uh, the USCIS and the Department of State are still in operation, meaning to say we don't we don't see them uh, face to face, but you can feel them because you're receiving these documents. Uh, you are able to file, uh, they process your application. So during this pandemic, uh, even if the situation is like this, I think I would still encourage uh, our Kababayan to please continue with their uh, applications for visa, especially, especially if they have expiring visas to continue to file for extension. Also, those uh, with expiring green cards, sometimes they only have two years. Even if it's pandemic, the USCIS is open. So I would suggest that they still continue with the process. Attorney, based on the current situation, uh, are we seeing that uh, this laws or restrictions will soon be eased or are we to expect an even stricter set of rules in the coming months or maybe in the coming years? Well, um, I don't want to actually delve into the politics of it, but honestly, it will depend on the results of the election uh, mm -hmm. in November. We have uh, one party who just likes to restrict immigration, and uh, we have one who is more open-minded, who believe in uh, fam family unity, who that party who actually believes in the importance of immigration to our country. So if that candidate wins, Yes, there's going to be a lot of positive changes, and I'm very optimistic. Okay, Atoy. Now let's move on to the more pressing matter. I mean, what is the current situation of most Filipinos now in the U.S.? I mean, how affected are they by the pandemic? Well, uh, it varies. Uh, here in uh, San Francisco, although it's not made public, the data is not made public just from, from people we know, there are uh, several families who are actually affected or, or who have the COVID. But then, you know how Filipinos are. They are very resilient. Uh, so, laban lang sila. And, you know, the next thing you know, they're okay. I have clients uh, where I had to postpone the case because uh, he contracted uh, the virus. And uh, USCIS is uh, very compassionate with that. They would. Uh, and just like last week, uh, we have to continue a case again because uh, someone, a Filipina who worked at the healthcare facility had contracted the virus. So we're not, uh, we're not exempt 
from the danger of this uh, coronavirus. And of course, you know that uh, we have the highest number of COVID uh, here in the US. <laughs> so hopefully mga Pilipino, magaling naman sila <laughs> to take care of themselves. And, and I do believe that they are fighters. <laughs> Attorney, um, I'm quite confused. If I have a tourist visa and I got um, stuck in the U.S., what are my options actually? If I was granted like at least two months of uh, tourist visa, okay, I be charged for overstaying or what are my options? Yeah, for example, if uh, you enter the U.S. in probably in, uh, by in August, you enter the U.S. and then uh, it's October now. You're by next week, uh, your visa ex is expiring, but you cannot get a flight back to the Philippines. What you can do is uh, you immediately file for an application for extension of your status. As long as USCIS receives that application for extension of status, then you will not uh, be considered in unlawful presence, even if that application is still pending. Mm -hmm. So it's important uh, for those who are watching, please uh, be very vigilant about what you need to do, especially when it comes to your status. The difficulty here is if you fall out of status and you didn't do anything, even if there are some opportunities uh, in the future, it might be difficult to change or uh, to extend your status here, or it will affect your future travel to the United States. Attorney, would you say that the current pandemic has uh, made the landscape even more difficult for a number of Filipinos in the U.S. right now? I mean, in terms of finding work or losing their job? Yes, the unemployment rate right now is uh, very high. Uh, so I, I know a lot of uh, people who lost their job uh, because of this pandemic because they work for industries uh, that are actually... Uh, affected, uh, like for example, uh, the uh, hospitality industry, the restaurants, uh, you know, but uh, do you know, of course, we all know tech that uh, there are also a lot of Filipinos who are in the healthcare industries. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, they are our heroes right now, they are essential workers. And uh, so with that, I think uh, Filipinos here are thriving in terms of uh, providing care uh, during this pandemic. Attorney, have you seen an increase in the number of Filipinos wanting to actually come home and eventually retire here in the Philippines? Uh, what opportunities do retiring Filipinos have in the U.S. if ever also? Well, well, in my, in my practice, uh, tech, I've always uh, seen uh, several of our kababayan after working hard in this country and have, after saving uh, so much, after sending their children to school, they actually have decided to retire for good in the Philippines. And so I still see that trend. Uh, and of course, there are also those, uh, those uh, immigrant, uh, Filipino immigrants who actually prefer to do it six months here, six months there. But with those uh, half half, I would say with those half and half, uh, they have uh, in property interest here in the U.S. and also in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So it actually uh, depends on a case by case on what the preference or uh, actually the goal of the uh, retiree is. But in the event that they do, will they still enjoy the benefits that should be accorded them under the U.S. law? I mean, how much of the how much of their actual benefits in the U.S. would they still get to enjoy when they decide to retire here in the Philippines? Every, everything they can still enjoy, especially if you're a U.S. citizen. The only issue that I see is the health care in the Philippines. Of course, I know it's uh, had improved a lot uh, in the last few years, uh, but I still see uh, some of the uh, senior citizen immigrants who have decided to retire they still come back here to the U.S. Uh, for their medical uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but if we're talking about their pensions, you know, they can still get those pensions. Now, uh, maybe uh, even uh, even green card holders, uh, they can bring their pensions uh, to the Philippines. 
the unfortunate fact is uh, for green card holders, if they're planning to retire uh, in the Philippines, they still they have to think of applying for citizenship first. Because if you're a green card holder, remember what I said before in my presentation, you cannot stay for more than a year outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. So if you plan to stay uh, outside the U.S. for more than a year, you might as well think of applying for a re-entry permit. Attorney, would you have data on how much of the total population actually considered going back here in the Philippines to retire and settle here eventually? Well, I don't have the actual data, but I know that uh, I have seen uh, one uh, one study or which shows that uh, from among the nationalities uh, in the U.S., from among the countries who are immigrants here, uh, I've seen that the Philippines have higher uh, number of uh, senior citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, so meaning to say these are those who have worked here for a long time. And we probably want to think about retiring also, either in the Philippines or here. Uh, it's a case by case. Uh, I've seen those who are very excited to go back. And I've seen those who said, who says that no, I'll stay here with my apple. <laughs> so it, it's different. Uh, the best talaga yung half and I would call the half and half. <laughs> Yeah. But attorney, same rule uh, po ba yung apply when I have a dual citizenship? I mean, if I decide to retire in the Philippines, we st will I still be entitled to my benefits as an immigrant? Yeah, uh, okay. Dual citizenship meaning you are still a U.S. citizen and a Philippine citizen. Mm -hmm. So the good thing about that is that you benefit uh, from both countries, <laughs> the rights of uh, being a U.S. citizen, the right of being a Filipino. And uh, you do not lose uh, your benefit as a U.S. citizen just because you are a dual citizen. Of course, there are exceptions if you are uh, holding a position of, uh, that involves national security. That's a different story. You will not be allowed to have another nationality. I think it's the same in the Philippines if you're holding or uh, a candidate for a position uh, for a national election. I think there are also limitations to that. But generally, uh, the benefits are just the same. But for those wanting to retire here, can they actually own a property here at all in the Philippines? I mean, are they... Uh, we, we, yeah, we all know that uh, natural-born uh, Filipino citizens, yes, they can uh, purchase with limitations, uh, mm -hmm. with certain limitations, uh, residential or even uh, farmlands. Uh, or commercial uh, properties. Now, if they apply for dual citizenship, there are no limitations. You're just like, you didn't lose your Filipino citizenship. You can actually purchase. Now, uh, if you are a US citizen and not a dual citizen, and you're not a natural born citizen, you're not eligible to become dual citizen. Of course, you cannot purchase property, but you can purchase the condo units depending on how much ownership the building has. How, man, how much a foreign national, percentage of the foreign nationals own Attorney, that particular uh, condo. Attorney, we have one question from our uh, viewer. No? What field of industry are most stable right now in the U.S., aside from the medical field? What kind of industries, if they're going to mm -hmm. invest? I think the tech, com the tech industry. The tech industry uh, are the most, uh, you know, they are thriving uh, right now. And uh, of course, uh, we have a not. I would not say the. I would not say the hospitality businesses, but anything that uh, deals with the with the essentials of food, uh, you know, like uh, food uh, distribution, etc. But uh, other than that, uh, I think uh, a lot of our Filipinos here in the U.S. are still in the healthcare industry. Either they own uh, home cares or uh, or different facilities or work in the, the hospital. Tony, I have another question here. Is there a standard formula to guarantee an, uh, the granting of an immigrant status? Okay. Uh, there is actually uh, no formula. <laughs> Because it uh, it's a case by but there's only one set of uh, law and one set of rules when it comes to immigration. So if you actually meet those eligibility requirements, for sure you're going to get uh, the immigrant visa. Now, if you're not qualified, you're just trying to push your luck. Uh, hopefully that uh, 
USCIS will uh, find it, uh, will find you eligible. I think those are the 50-50 and I would not advise that they do that. Uh, also, for example, if uh, someone just wants to get a green card and then uh, marry a random US citizen uh, for convenience, that one, the USCIS already know if it's a fraudulent and it will have a serious uh, legal consequence. Uh, just to, again, going back to your question, there is just one set of immigration law and one set of regulation. If you follow that, for sure, you're going to have the visa that you want. Mm -hmm. Attorney, another question here is, what advice can you give to Filipinos looking to acquire an immigrant status or to those wishing to go back to the Philippines and retire here? So this is for both um, sets, the ones wanting yeah. to immigrate and the ones wanting to retire in the Philippines. Yeah, for those who want to come to the U.S., I, I always tell my clients there are only two ways to actually uh, immigrate in the U.S. Uh, on a permanent basis. One is through family-based petition and the employment-based petition. If you have family members who can petition you, then go ahead and have that petition filed kahit na matagal, even if it takes a long time. Go ahead and do that. And then uh, the second one is employment base. You know, uh, I, I just noticed that uh, a lot of uh, Filipinos are skilled workers also. There are professionals. Uh, we, have, uh, we have those in the field of uh, medicine uh, who are actually applying for a green card to go ahead and uh, prepare or uh, have their U.S. employer petition for them. Now, uh, to summarize, that's a family and employment base. Now, you asked me about those who want to retire in the Philippines. Uh, I think uh, if you want to retire in the Philippines, uh, apply for dual citizenship uh, so that there will be no hassle. You can, you can benefit uh, from uh, from both countries, Philippines and the U.S. So if you're in the Philippines, you can do what you want. Same here in when you are in the U.S. And if you are not yet a U.S. citizen and you are a green, you are a green card holder, make sure that you maintain your status. I've had clients who are really, they have their green card. They waited for 20 or 25 years to get their green card. Once they're here, they still want to go back to the Philippines. Now, my advice is uh, please uh, make sure you still hold your status by applying for re-entry. If you're not ready, there's such thing as re-entry permit. Then you can stay in the Philippines for two years. I've had clients who had extended their re-entry permit uh, multiple times. Okay, so Attorney, that's my... we're down to our last question. Um, is it now a good time to apply for an immigrant status or should I put it on hold? No, don't put it on hold. This is the best time to apply. If you already have a willing employer, go ahead and file for immigrant status uh, or unemployment-based petition, especially if your employer really needs you and the job offer is there, just make sure that they have your employer has the financial ability to pay your wages. Uh, as far as a family-based petition is concerned, if you receive a notice from the National Visa Center, you only have one year to respond to that. Uh, please attend uh, to your visa applications. Uh, the law may be the law may be changing uh, soon, but at least uh, you do your part now, and I'm sure that there will be positive uh, consequence uh, when the time comes for the new administration. Attorney Lu, sorry, I know I said it's uh, the, my last question, but we have another one here, if it's okay with you, from Mr. Raimundo Hippolito. Can you please talk about the impact of double taxation if you are a dual citizen? Isn't that an issue? Okay. Uh, that's usually, uh, thank you, Raimundo, for that question. That is usually uh, the concern of uh, a lot of uh, those who wants to retire. But uh, it's good that uh, US and the Philippines uh, has uh, entered into a treaty. They have a treaty where there will be no dual taxation, um, double taxation. Meaning to say, if you have earnings here in the US, uh, you pay your income tax here. And for the earnings in the Philippines, you have to pay your taxes there, but you have to report both your income here uh, with Uncle Sam, although they're not going to charge you anymore or to ask for taxes, uh, it has to be declared uh, in your ITR. 
Tony, sorry. Um, an another follow-up question. We all know and we are familiar that most of our Filipino kababayans working there would usually send money here in the Philippines. Would you say that um, investing on something like a, a property would be a wise move for Filipinos living a abroad? Or should they just purchase a property in the States? I mean, which is... Their personal. That's a good question, but it is a personal preference. Uh, uh, so I, I am said that... Uh, it depends on what the goal is. Uh, sometimes I've seen uh, some clients, uh, they keep uh, sending money just to support education of their children. They don't have enough to purchase. But I've also seen some who have enough, saved enough on their 401k and then they're using that money to purchase. So it's a personal preference. So I cannot really generalize it. Uh, although there is, of course, a trend uh, of people wanting to retire in the Philippines uh, for some. <laughs> and uh, and if they do that, they actually start early. They save and then they purchase. So it's a case by case. That was such a great discussion, informative and helpful and inspiring. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. But before we officially close our episode, may we hear some final thoughts from Attorney Lu Otensinko. Final thoughts, Attorney Lu. Yeah, of course, uh, I'd like just to do my thank yous. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to share this important information to our viewers. Uh, actually, uh, Ortigas Lan had agreed that the beneficiary of this webinar will be the University of the Philippines uh, Kaagapay uh, program. Thank you so much, to, especially to the marketing team of Ortigas Lan, uh, to Philippine Daily Inquirer. Uh, my colleague and friend, Chito Desosido, for recommending me to Ortigas Land. I'd like to thank my attorneys and staff of Tansinko Law Firm. My family, uh, Ray, Jan, Aina, many thanks. And to our viewers, thank you for watching and for your support. We are still in a state of emergency because of this global pandemic, and we are in uncharted territory. Immigration law and policies change, but we only have one chance in life. So when it comes to choosing between your immigration petition and your safety, please choose the latter. Even USCIS website still has a postings which says that if you have symptoms that resembles uh, the symptoms of coronavirus, please do not hesitate whether or not you have the legal status. Do not hesitate to take medical treatment or preventive services. Receipt of benefit is just one factor in the future and it is not determin determinative of whether or not your visa petition is going to approve. Please take care and be safe always. Until next time, maraming maraming salamat. Thank you, Attorney Lu. And that wraps up our broadcast. Thank you again for sharing your time, insights, and expertise with us today po. And thank you everyone who tuned in for this episode of Spotlight by Ortigas Land. Again, this is Texa Maniego, and I would like to invite everyone to get their daily dose of property news in the Inquirer's property section, which comes out every Saturday. Again, thank you, stay safe, and have a good day, everyone. Thank you, Attorney Lu. Thank you, Ortigas Land. Thank you, Tech.